Hey everyone, welcome to another AI conversation. And today I'm happy to be joined by I guess everyone knows her, but you know, this is a good time to get to, to know her again. No? Miss Rosario Kahukom Bradbury. Uh hi Rosario, welcome to the show. Hi, Doc. Nice to see you again, but this time virtually. Long time no see. Yeah, yeah. And uh I remember, of course, we met before Contact Islands, uh, but I think that was the context when we first met uh almost a year ago, no? Uh and That is true. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the context was AI uh and Correct. contact centers. Uh but we'll get to that in a bit, no. I wanted Well, anyway, but, first um for maybe but the But before one... that you met me, you met yeah. me not at Contact Island but no. during your convention conference the AI the... summit. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, right. AI summit of AAP, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In fact, there's a number of AI summits happening these days. Now back in the day it was like Okay, we'll have an AI summit. Uh, it was kind of weird to have one, but I think now it's obvious people need to be talking about artificial intelligence. No? Uh, so yeah, but wait, um, I'm sure everyone probably knows you listening, but maybe for that one person who was uh, under a rock for, for years, maybe give us a brief background on yourself and then let's get on with the, the discussion. Okay, okay. Basically, I, I started my career with the testing inspection certification company. They call it the tick industry. And I work with SGS, uh, which is the world's leading inspection and testing. I started there as a telephone operator and rose my way up to become the CEO and managing director for the same company. So basically from telephone operator to receptionist, the data entry operator, to throne all over the world to become executive secretary and then assistant manager operations, and then re-engineering the business model of SGS, one of the very first shared services. So after SGS, I, I, uh, I stayed there for 30 years. So I was handling the commercial inspection of inspection testing laboratory in the Philippines and Guam. And at the same time, I started to build uh, with a team the Global Shared Services, the BPO, in the Philippines competing with the other countries affiliates of SGS. So it was Chile and Philippines as the BPO then. And so I was managing these two uh, entities of SGS in the Philippines and Guam. And then I moved to the U.S., and I joined Authentics. Authentics is the one that puts a nanotechnology into the $100 bill to make it secured, uh, naked to the eye. And at the same time, the nanotechnology you put onto the fuel to trace whether the fuel is smuggled or not on an international trade. So my background is very much in the international trade. And the companies I work with, our technologies are very advanced in that aspect. And then I uh, I was headhunted to go to back to the Philippines and, and headed the managing director for Contact Center Association of the Philippines, my most recent stint. In between, I've, I was doing a podcast as well or hosting during pandemic uh, and there's a, and board uh, of Filipino CEO Circle before and the Wallace Business Forum and, and the UCLA Anderson alumni, as I, I'm an alumni of that. So that's in a nutshell of what I'm doing. And of course, I do a part-time in Amazon when I'm here in America. You do everything and anything. That's an amazing journey to put in a nutshell, no. But again, um, if you don't mind, I'll I'll just pick uh pick a few things from what I heard. Uh, well, the first thing is it's amazing how the first thing you did in your career was called telephone operator. I don't think we 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 call it that anymore, no. So yeah. for the for the people who were never born yet, <laughs> weren't born yet during that time, can you explain how that uh, the industry looked at that time this was probably in the late 80s no going into the 90s so how how was that, that? how was the how was the environment at that time yeah first of all it was a, a pabx you know the big pabx of eastern telecoms and eastern telecoms is still there okay um so it's a big pabx and somebody just calls and you you greet them and hello this is says just my help you and you just basically connect them to whoever they need to speak to i don't handle the customer handling at that point because I throw it to the agents for that matter. Because there, there was no uh, CXO at the time. Yeah, there's no call center. Yeah, that was in 1986. So, and at the time, there was telex and facsimile machine, which the current generation don't know that. Uh, the anymore. thermal paper. <laughs> yeah, the thermal paper and things like that. So that was a telephone operator job. And then I moved to a receptionist and so forth and so on. But it was a PABX, a big monstrous machine. At the time, you know, but before that, I work in McDonald's. Uh, by the way, yeah, I work with uh, uh, Richard Gomez. We were all batchmates. Wow, legit, McDo. Yeah, uh, McDo yeah, was McDo. 
didn't Macdo make their debut r- right around the same time, you know? Uh, that is correct. About 80s. And uh, the store I joined was the fourth store in the Philippines. Uh, uh, Richard Goma and myself, we were the young ones then. We were college students and uh, we were we were doing all stuff then, you know? Yeah, I remember. Obviously, obviously, I was I was a very young young person back then. But this was before Starbucks, you know. Oh and, yeah, and Be- way before KFC Starbucks. KFC was called Kentucky Fried Chicken, as in full spelling. Ah, that is correct. And we were and competing with Wendy's. At Wendy's, the time. tama. And then you had stores and, like and then Jollibee suddenly appeared. Yeah. Oh, Jollibee came later, no? Okay, okay. Yeah, Jollibee came later, and then they uh, some of my colleagues in McDonald's moved to Jollibee and. And and they suddenly became pattern in terms of standards of service. But Jollibee right. is all over the country now, you know, all over the world now. Yeah, very different time. And obviously, yes. how we appreciate technology back then is very different. So oh, yeah. you met you mentioned some stuff when you when you worked in SGS. No, could you talk about what was the term artificial intelligence already used, or you know what was the equivalent back in the day? Yeah, well. At that time, you know, I became part of a re-engineering group. The word re-engineering was still the word, you know. Uh, basically, we remodeled the business model. Um, because the SGS is present in 150 countries. So it is like a little kingdom on its own. Repetitive, same processes in each country. So what we did was we combined the repetitive processes. And we, uh, how do you call that, uh, regionalized certain competency centers. The point is this. In order to gain a lot of efficiency, we had to do a lot of automation and look at all the databases common present in 150 countries. So, and we've seen nine disparate systems. You know, we have the AS400s and the AS36 and the XPC at the time. But what's important is the data that we collect in the 150 countries. And we have to clean that data because it was garbage in the way it was written. So we had to structure it. So that then when algorithms has been designed, that the keywords are there, automatically the system will identify what type of commodity being being examined. Now, let me backtrack on this because we were dealing with international trade. So if you talk of international trade, are goods going from one country to another? So when one goods is coming from one country to another, it goes and enters into an importing country to the customs, Bureau of Customs. And customs have to identify the classification of that commodity, how much duties and taxes and the valuation. So in order to do that, risk management was applied. And in order to do risk management, we have to understand all of the knowledge data of international goods coming in and out of the country. So we developed those goods description, which is the generic specific, the color, what's the function, And then the computer will immediately identify for you the first six digits of the international harmonized code. And then the trade analysts will have to elevate their knowledge on what is the remaining uh, digits to make it more specific. So that's when more complex job is done because before it was done by human from the first digit to the ninth, but the computer now we're doing it based on the databases, algorithms and the words the first six digits is already identified to you by the artificial intelligence, if you could call it, but we call it an automation at the time, okay? And then you cannot just override it unless a higher level of management will look at it and clean the database. But it took a long time because you you have to clean the data because as you know, with nine disparate system, 150 affiliates, even though you do the same business model, but you interpret how you write the commodity. So we had to clean the data for that matter. So there was there was those automation already happening. And another automation that was happening, I don't know whether you consider that as a generative AI right now, is a uh, shipping documents in an international trade, shipping documents like bill of lading, final documents, is sent to a facsimile, but that facsimile is an image. And once, if it's sent from Japan and then sent to the processing unit or the BPO now is called, it's automatically back into the image and it's indexed automatically by the computer, whether it is a bill of lading or an invoice and so forth. So you could see it eliminated a lot of the manual work of the people. And then we had to retrain them how to do more complex jobs. So in essence, it's quite similar to the impact of generative AI right now, but in but probably in a bigger scale right now because data is now in the cloud. At that time, we didn't have cloud. 
So the data was in a server somewhere uh, that is hitting the risk management for that matter. So it, it was already at, a, and that was in year 2000, by the way, okay? 2000, because that's when we started the back office of SGS in year 2000 on international trade. And that's where we started this risk management uh, automation for that matter. I don't know if I make sense, but no, so no. SGS started as a knowledge processing. We didn't start yeah. as a BPO. It was yeah. knowledge-based. And then we went backward. Okay, let's do call center. The call center was the last one we did, but we mm. started on a knowledge base. Yeah, I mean, uh, what what you what you just shared brings me back to the good old days of data warehousing and uh, no, exactly, yeah, and, you know, which is basically still the the game today. No, you have to cleanse uh -huh. data, you have to store it. Only yeah. then can the algorithms talk. No? In many ways, people are kind of looking at the the tail wagging the dog now, and everyone's obsessed with the algorithm, but it starts with data. So wait again. I have so many directions to go with this because this is good. Um, talk. Can you share a bit about difficulties during the the transformation? Okay. What what I mean because everyone says transformation is not easy to do, and people sometimes, you know, blame technology. Uh, of course, it's the easiest thing to blame. But in in your story, I mean, did you encounter challenges and what what, what I mean? How did you resolve them? Um, that's very true. And managing change is the most difficult thing. So if we're now being disrupted with that generative AI, we were also disrupted because of the new business model. Because that new business model was centralizing repetitive tasks and regionalizing competency center. So what were the challenges there? If each of the country in 150 countries have their own kingdom of the same people, inspectors, trade analysts, uh, price comparator, those were the, the people, the price comparator, the trade analyst, the classifier, the inspectors, and things like that. So some of that roles were dissolved in that country. And it got centralized and the others were regionalized. What was regionalized is those competency of particular industry vertical. So if we're inspecting automotive, who is the expert of automotive of which region? If we're inspecting agri, which one? So because of that, we had to, uh, how do you call this? We had to redeploy people. And we have to upskill people to understand the new business model. So in redeploying people, you have to reskill them, upskill them to understand the new business model, that they cannot be doing the same thing that they used to do because it gets centralized into the processing unit in either Philippines or Chile at the time and regionalized by certain regions of the country. So the challenge was them transferring that knowledge that was stored in their brain and to transfer it into the centralized or to the regionalized. So the resistance was very strong. So if a company is not very good in the documentation of their processes and their knowledge databases, it is difficult to pull it out from a person's brain to put it out there. So we... So you see, when you do change, it's either you lift it first, which is you standardize, you improve the quality before you shift the work to a new business model. What happened there? Because there was, we need to make the change very fast because of financial consideration. So instead of lift and shift, we shift it immediately and lift it. Meaning once the work has been shifted on a centralized, we need to clean the data where it was moved, meaning to lift it. Lift is to improve it, improve the quality of the data, make sense out of it, throw out the garbage and, and, and all of that thing. So what we did is we had to make 24 change agents all over the world. And I was the global change manager at the time. So I had 24 change agents all over the world. So we do training for them, uh, teaching them how to manage the change of the new business model which is shifting the role of people to a new role. That's why we call it, we redeploy them. So what we also did was that because people were resisting into trying to give the knowledge that was stored in the brain that was not into a knowledge database, we imported that talent into the center, into the Philippines and Chile for us to get a face-to-face -face transfer of knowledge. And then in the hope that they understood the new business model and you would deploy them to new, higher complex skills when they go back to the country 
where they were before. So in essence, it's quite similar in essence. So you, you see in change, there are two paths. Huh? Uh, in change, either you're doing it because you're committed to do it, you believe in it, you have trust in it, or you're doing it out of compliance. So this is what my boss says, so this is the new process. I'll do it whether, even though I don't like it. It's to save my job and so forth. So the two paths of change are a commitment or a compliance. And hopefully that compliance moved to a commitment because eventually they understood what it means and what it does for them and that it is a better career path for them for being redeployed in that area. Unfortunately, we have to lose some people, those that who are not able to cope into being redeployed or reskilled or upskilled or for those who just decided that this doesn't work, you know, and they decided to go and move on because there were technology involved. So some people can adopt with technology and some people couldn't. So the resistance of change is enormous. Uh, it's even on a global scale because at 150 countries, there were two countries selected as a processing unit, Philippines and Chile. And, and every time I try to get a job from one country, not that I'm getting the job, it's just that it gets transferred to the new business model and people will, will tease the colleague. For example, let's say country X. I don't want to mention a country here in Europe. A country X would say, hey, why are you cooperating with Rosario? Are you being a Filipino already? You're not anymore in our nation. You know, it it culture suddenly played a game uh, and, and uh, saying that the superiority and then why are you giving it over there? So it, this was in the two, 2000, okay? So there were a lot of resistance. So it's very important that you're, you've got to buy in from the top down and it's a business model that is being really rallied from the top uh, that this is the new business model and we're investing into this and so forth and so on. Um, we had problems along the way, technology-wise, okay? Um, because it was done so fast, so the people cannot cope that fast because we were given eight months to do it because there was a financial uh obligation, not obligation, there was a financial target to make it happen in eight months before the year end so that you close the books better, okay? So people were really rushed to know the new business model. And then the technology was from nine disparate systems, scrunched to three systems. Migration has happened and those migration was tough, okay? And there was like a, a, uh, a shuffle of documents in the virtual world. What I mean by that? Because if Japan sent me an invoice to the Philippines uh, and to Chile and automatically an image come there and uh, Australia also sent me, for some reason, it got shuffled like a deck of cards. So you don't know which is the page one and the page two anymore of that document. So there was some technology glitch for a short while that you have to put a stop and say, let's clean up the mess. So, you know, it was a painful one, but I have to say eventually we got there. And we got the financial target. We we got the operational efficiency that we were expecting and the cost performance efficiency. It took a while. We had to put a lot of incentive program uh, to the people. Yeah, that's a you know it's an amazing story. And I mean, I mean anecdotes, no. But maybe the one maybe one two things I want I want to anchor on there is. I think 90% of what you just shared seemed like a people challenge, <laughs> resistance to change. And then you mentioned an interesting word that I haven't heard anyone else use other than myself, no, the term kingdom, you know, um, because it's really true. In in organizations, there are kingdoms, there are territories. Right. <laughs> and and each each territory deals with each other similarly, similar to countries. No, there's diplomatic relations between one department and another. And, and I guess in your case, it's multi-geography. Um, okay, so yeah, I I can relate to this because I also worked in a in a multinational BPO that was doing offshoring, um, which is kind of the in-house term for outsourcing or you offshore if it's within your same brand. Right? So and there was a resistance. In my case, it was Australians resistant to send to send banking work to the Philippines. That's already long, long done. Um, but back to you, did it did it become I know, sorry to use that term. Did it become racist also? Did, did it become, uh, or is it purely just because people were worried about their jobs? Because I can sense that in some companies, there can be a bit of a racial overtones also. I ex I certainly yeah. experienced 
educational discrimination no? in, 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 in my own experience. No? So what kinds of resistance did you encounter? Well, first of all, really, it's a resistance because it is protecting their own job. Yeah, I think that's very important because they could see that they, they see the writing on the wall that they may lose the job because the task that they used to do is going to another place for that one. Okay, uh, there was an undertone of some, uh, I wouldn't call it racist, but maybe that's the right term. Maybe that's not the right term. It's just saying, why the Philippines? Why not in our country to be the processing where we're most efficient? But because when, when selection of the processing unit, there were many factors. Of course, there was cost, the educational level, the language, and all that factors were present in the Philippines and in Chile. And in comparison, for example, the cost doing it in Japan or the cost doing it in Germany and so forth. So it's just that the people from that country probably doesn't have the full picture on a management level of what is the obligate or what is the goal and the mission of it. And, and that is where it's important, even in generative AI, the goal and the mission must be very clear and transparent from top to bottom. Otherwise, resistance will be there. You see, in generative AI, not not even generative AI, but during my change, it's all about trust. You know, do you trust this new model that I got used to this old model and I'm moving there? Can I trust this? So to answer your questions, there was a resistance because it may cost your job. Second, it's something that they've been there doing it for, uh, for decades and then suddenly a major change and so fast, okay? Uh, so there was a level of insecurity in that area. Um, and then, of course, there was some undertone of why there, why not to us? Because they know there was a competition among 150 countries. Who would be the centralized, who would be the competent team? And if they're not selected, why were we not selected? We're more superior in technology. We have higher educational level. We are multilingual and so forth and so on. So it's a lot of combination in that end. But the bottom line really is more... Uh, the job, job safety and security. Uh, anything on the undertone of, of racial or comparison of one country, I believe just came as an afterthought to make their defense a stronger one. But bottom line is always job, your, your source of earnings of, to put food on the table. Yeah, it's a primal fear for a lot of people. And it's yes, the same yes. fear every time. I mean, long before AI, automation, uh, you know, every time technology rears its head, talagang job security yung kalaban. Okay, right. let's look at the yeah. other side. Why why did the Philippines, you know, in a way, win the win the quote unquote the the war? No, uh, or was that just an accident? The fact that you already had a center in the Philippines or in Manila. I mean, what, um, what do you think? There's anything special there? Why why we why we got the work? Um, funny you ask that because it was in early 1990s when we were already redesigning the business model, okay? So the BPO or offshoring or nearshoring wasn't even coined yet, okay? And at that time, we hired um, consultants. You know, we were even joking, oh my God, who is this kid walking around and they have a doctorate and things like that. But they are so future thinkers, you know? So they, they pick a, a few of us and I was one of the lucky that was picked uh, in order to identify the process. Um, when the model was designed, and then it was then which affiliate country will do it, okay? First, you have to design the model without thinking which country or where you want to do it. But the logic of you centralized, repetitive, this can be computerized, this can be automated, this can be regionalized. The selection was very transparent in a sense that the top management has identified where it is. One, it has to be, at that time, it was a cost arbitrage, okay? It was a labor arbitrage at that time, okay? So where is the most inexpensive? So obviously, they looked at Philippines, okay? They also had to look at in the Latin America, which is the most inexpensive. Why? Because we have contracts in Latin American language. So we have to cater to our clients, it has to be customer focused when you do anything else. And the customer requires it is in Latin American language or in French language or in English. So Philippines in its sense already got it in ter terms of labor arbitrage, in terms of cost at the time, in terms of educational uh, capability or the number of graduates in the country. Okay, so they looked at that and they looked at um, 
in terms because you know we do with commodities international commodities so we were looking for engineers and all of that discipline and there were a lot in in the philippines obviously india has more engineers but the language was has become our competitive advantage not that we were doing call center we were not a call center it's just to be able to understand the english because most of the inspection reports all over the world are in english and when you're in english then you have to understand the commodity because you've got that discipline in your education. So it was that in terms of quality of work was measured later, okay? So when we started it, we measure productivity, quality, and speed, and then later consistency, okay? So it was, an, it was a package of uh, performance efficiency, cost performance efficiency. You know, it's not just cost, the performance, but at first we just rack on the productivity until we dealt with the quality. Why the Philippines? Because Philippines has initially the cost or labor arbitrage and the graduates and the English language. So that's why we were chosen. And Chile was chosen because of the Latin America and they were the most inexpensive at the time in that part of the world. So that's where the criteria was. And eventually Chile got dissolved and it got moved to the Philippines, everything else. Ah, so the Chile operation was eventually absorbed into Philippines. I guess correct, yeah. I, I guess because Philippines is doing pretty well. No, I'm just making an assumption. Uh, that is correct. But you have to understand that's just the 10 business lines. So we were only doing one business line at the time, mm. which is on the international trade of government contracts of import and export. Eventually we diversified or we became so entrepreneurial that we handled others in the agri division, in the IT division on the functional. Mm -hmm. on the functional for the infrastructure, the development and help desk. Uh, and then in the life sciences for laboratory. So it, it we became, because we were getting tired of higher fire, higher fire. So we said, hey, how can we, before we fire this person, maybe we can get another account from our affiliate. And then the finance and accounting and purchasing became one of the last. And yeah. our first model was Australia on purchasing for that matter. So it, it started with one of the 10 divisions. You make a champion out of it. So they believe in it. And then you capture the other ones. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, You mentioned hire and fire. So obviously one of the big concerns uh, these days is how AI can displace people. No? Uh, and I'm obviously one of the, one of the few uh, public uh, people who, who doesn't buy it. Of course, it's so sexy because it to say, uh, there will be massive job losses. So in your in your in your in your journey, was that the case? Was there a net loss in jobs or because I feel it's the opposite. There's a net gain every time you invest in some form of automation. But it's hard to see it before it happens. Eh? So now in hindsight, how how did that play out? Okay. Um basically if I look at it, the profit margin have increased by doing it because of the productivity and efficiency gain for that. So there is a lot of economical gain, okay? For economic gain uh, and profit margin for growth. Uh, so, and there was a career growth for others, okay? That is if you're willing to go for the career. As the company grow in terms of its profit and, and productivity to capture more market or to capture more job, because if you could do so much only with 100 people, okay, fine, you can do now same for only 70 people, uh, but you can absorb more in terms of volume and value, okay? But at the same time, people will have to look at it that there is career growth for that matter because then you have to upskill and to understand more complex jobs or be redeployed in the other region of the world, okay? that if you were a, a, a data trade analyst before, maybe then the trade analysis, which is done now in automation uh, into the AI type at the time, you are no longer just doing as a trade analyst. You're doing cases that is appealed by the importer that they disagree with the findings of SGS. So you do on a deeper knowledge of defending. You're like becoming a lawyer now. You defend the findings that it is let me give an example that um, what was imported was simple one, a glass, a drinking glass, and it is not a window glass. So people can say it's a glass. So just that 
because a window glass may be a rate of duty of 5% and a drinking glass may be 20%. People will fight. It is at the 5% because it is this one. Okay. So because they, they want to get more, lesser payment of duties and taxes when they import or export. So what my point is that people that we reskill have been taught to defend the findings of SGS on the basis of the international trade law for that matter. So yes, we lost some people, but mainly because at the end of the day, the future is in their hands. It's up to you if you want to learn. It's up to you if you want to go forward into the new business model, into the in learn new technology and learn the new way of working. It's a new process, a new way of working. It's a new skill that you can put in your credentials. But if you are resisting to it, management and leaders doesn't just cut people. You give a chance to the people, you train them, you reskill them, and you give them the opportunity to perform. And after that, and it doesn't work, management role is to find them where they fit most in the new business model. And if they don't fit anywhere else, it's it's a hard goodbye, unfortunately. Yeah, but it sounds like the law, like an actual loss is probably the last resort, no? Parang you have oh, to correct. exhaust. It's, yeah. it's the last resort that you remove people. Hmm. Because you look at, as good leaders, you first look at the competency skill of that person and whether that is trainable whether that person has the right attitude to want to be trained and learn. Yeah. You don't just remove just because his past performance is so bad. You give them the opportunity to shine in the new model. You may never know you haven't tapped that competency skill of that person. Yeah, and you're talking about performance problems. I think for the most part, most people are doing fine in terms of their performance. You know, Otherwise, these companies would be collapsing so there's le I would say there's less onus to let go of a, a good performer, much less a top performer. But it's funny, uh, I think the I, I think it's less now. I remember when I when when we uh when I first spoke at Quantac Islands, there was a palpable fear, if not a curiosity, you know, a weird curiosity that okay, are we really gonna lose half of our workforce and so I like, wow, this is bordering on hysteria. No? And because the news articles were coming out. And then it's not like Gen AI. Of course, I'm a big uh, advocate. But it's not like Gen AI is, uh, is not without errors. It's not without, you know, it's something that humans aren't needed to fix. If anything, it gives more work pa nga, <laughs> because you have to correct what the AI did. So it's a net gain in terms of work. Um, well, on, the, on the upside, it's a net productivity gain. But then on the downside, you know, instead of correcting human error, you now have to correct human plus AI errors, <laughs> especially in software development. No? So I, I, di I just didn't see it the same way many people did. And I, I'm happy to report that uh, a year later, that, that hysteria has seemed to have died down, but it's still yeah. there. You know, It's just so it's interesting because the, the way the news paints it. Anyways, again, so back to you. Um, certainly SGS was a big, uh, a big chapter. Um, let's talk about uh, your most recent uh, chapter, like overseeing the growth of uh, the BPO sector, you know, or at least when you came in, what what kind of environment did you find? You, know, you you mentioned you were you were headhunted, so you'd already been living abroad, and then you're back. What what environment did you see, and then has it moved in terms of uh, the way the way it manages itself, the way people think and act, the way companies are growing? Oh, yes, it did. Yeah, as, as I mentioned, I was headhunted. That was in September of 2022, mm -hmm. basically. And I started October. Um, they, uh, they, it was, as you know, Contact Center Association of the Philippines is one of the subsectors of the ITBPM industry. Yep. Okay. And what we did, and because the mission was the 2028 roadmap, okay, uh, which is to, to become a, a $59 billion revenue. An additional 1.1 million more jobs. And it was a countryside effort. So what we did is really make a, a survey of where are these members? As you know, we have members of the BPO companies. So we made a survey of all of these BPO companies operating for contact center and business process. Where are you going? Where do you plan to grow? Okay. And so they've given us a landscape of where in the digital cities of the 7,100 islands of the Philippines, where they're going. 
And on that basis, we try to uh, enable their growth in that area. Let them meet with LGU or identify what, what are the problems they're having in terms of talent identification, infrastructure, and so forth. And I tell you, even within my one year of staying in, in SICA, they really were true to their word because left and right, they were launching new offices uh, for, for that matter. And and I would get invitations from our members that their, their principal is visiting from the United States, coming to the Philippines, wants to understand where can they grow in the Philippines and what is the landscape. Okay, and, and talking about AI, as you know, a third party BPO or outsourcing, you've got multiple clients or principals and not all of them are ready to go on an AI. Some are matured and some are not. And of course you have to do a case model of that. So as a service provider, you do the case model and you present it to your client, but not all clients are yet ready because it depends on the data and where it is stored. And, you know, just like what happened in SHS, we have to clean the data and so forth before it can get ready to a production level. So definitely even within that first year of the 2028 roadmap in 2023, the growth was really enormous from 32.5. If I'm not mistaken, we ended up at 35 now, a uh, billion dollar revenue uh, and, and a lot of, of additional uh, full-time uh, employee all over the country. And you know, places that they've been going is they've been going to Isabella, for example. Uh, and, and that means that the infrastructure in our country are getting ready. And thanks to DICT, who has this uh, Digital Cities Plus Plus, you know, they have now a plus plus uh, that they are helping the LG to get ready and the ICT there. Yeah. So my stint there, I think, has been very fruitful. And I tell you, I went back to the country when it was offered to me. It's a nonprofit because it is a way of giving back. Because I felt, I understand the pain points of the BPO having done it with SGS, uh, being the first Swiss company to have the offshoring back office. So I, I more or less, I felt like I know the industry more or less. But it was a different thing because you were seeing it in a bigger picture. It was my small world as SGS then. There I saw more than 100, 150, 200 members of different models and, and different uh, challenges that they have. You know, and I'm obviously listening to you and talking to a number of people from the industry. And, and my stint in the BPO sector, as it were, was very short. I was in uh, uh, a GIC setup for a little, uh, just a little less than three years. But I think I hit it when banking was on the ascendant. I was working for ANZ and we had the likes of JP Morgan, HSBC, Deutsche. It's amazing how many similar stories were being crafted right about the yeah. same time, you know. And I meet someone, I hear about what you went through. Hey, I went through something like that. So it's almost a cultural zeitgeist happening in the Philippines without people mentioning it, no? Uh, it, it's a massive shift of how careers were being created, how staffing was being redone. And I think the trickle-down effect is it's affected the, the education sector. I remember... Oh, yeah. Talking about telephone operator, no. <laughs> I remember when, when uh, I think it was e telecare, no, that was starting to head uh, to to recruit mm -hmm. uh, when I was in college, and that was the the undertone. The wow, you want to be a telephone operator, and then you know just shift shifted five years later, the telephone operators were now operations managers, you know, earning upwards. Yeah. Uh, and and a lot of people said, hey, 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 I missed that boat. No, where? How can I get back in? And then. Uh, and then when I got in, I think the the BPO sector was already kind of in a in a mature state. I just love it how people keep for parang forecasting the end of call centers or the end of BPOs. So I think the I, I love talking about this. The most famous anecdote I'm uh, I'm aware of is the Telstra CEO, and he said, <laughs> you know, call centers won't exist in five years now because of AI. And I said, Awan and Jos, that was 10 years ago. <laughs> and we must have grown by a million call center jobs since he made that forecast. So talagang you don't want you don't want you want you don't want to be on the wrong side of that uh, of that argument because a lot of people have failed. But just because they've failed doesn't mean it won't happen eventually. But I have yeah. very, very serious doubts it's gonna play out the way it did. And a lot of it is because of culture. You know, culture and process, basically what you've shared, no. So, so again, yeah, I, I want to ask you this. Um, there are 
leaders in in the IT BPM sector, they're leaders in the call center industry. So from your very macro lens and having gone through the the ranks, no, what are like ty- the top five, I would say, characteristics that you would prescribe for resiliency in this industry? So I think I never had that kind of a mentor. No? I don't know if you did. No? So I, that was always my regret. So any, t- any chance I get, I try to seek mentorship advice. So let's try to mentor a lot of the people in, in their jobs right now, in call centers, in BPOs, IT BPM. What are five or so things that you would give them as a prescription? You know, it's funny you say that because sometimes the business is going so fast that people are put in a situation of you swim or you drown. Right. You know? uh, without a mentor or without the luxury of time of somebody holding your hands as you go through that. Okay. Yeah. And now we have this mentorship program and so forth. But on a lens of looking at it, what could be a, quite a successful person leading that? Obviously, for one, it has to be somebody who's really agile, who's very, you know, very fast in shifting and very foresight in terms of looking at it and understanding that what is the implication of this process and very anticipative already of what I should do now to prevent what potential bigger risk is there okay so that's that's very important it's it's you don't have to be it's a plus to know the industry and the vertical sector you're serving it's a plus but at the end of the day it's leadership quality okay and that leadership quality is be able to anticipate that and what can you do in order to minimize the potential risk but doing that is so easy to say but the qualities of a person, of a leader who listens, because you have to listen because it's people who is going to get affected towards the change. And by listening uh, is knowing the people that you deal with, not to much extent of knowing their personal circumstances, but first knowing their competency skills and then personal circumstances and then matching them of where they should be going. So listening skill is very key uh, for that matter. Um, integrity uh, is key because at the end of the day is walk the talk. Uh, if you are not true to what you say that you will do, you will lose the trust of the people that you are trying to shepherd towards the new model. Uh, you, you have to walk the talk. You have to, you have to really do what you've committed. You know, so that that is that the person that is very foresight integrity and the listening skill um the other one is how do you call it the curiosity okay when i say curiosity it is it is empathy with emotional intelligence uh when i say empathy with emotional intelligence that is not curiosity is i'm curious about you but it is with emotional intelligence. I'm not curious because I'm just curious for chismis or but I'm curious because I am concerned of what's going on with the genuine you you sincerity, no? There's the sincerity. We call that curiosity. So so really a, a leader must have the sense of curiosity. Because in the sense of curiosity, the skill of listening comes out and the emotional honesty comes out meaning you're honest and you're not just saying it as a script. You know, if you go sometimes in some stores here, it's just like, hi, how can I help you? And then when you answer, then you turn away, you know? Right, uh, right. It's a script. So you wouldn't like that, okay? And then honesty uh, to your people is is very key for that matter. And of course, ad, ad, agile. And another one is, you know, it's always a trait combination between men and women. And it's always, if you have the best trait of both together, that's perfect. Mm. Meaning as a woman, you're not just, you've got a lot of soft skills, you listen and so forth, but you must have really, you know when to to really put a stop. Draw the line. You know when push you have push the button. It's just that us women, for example, it takes a lot, for me personally, it takes a long time before you push me off the wall. Right. And then once you push me off the wall, I put my foot down and said, I'm sorry, I've done everything for you, you're out. You know, it, it, otherwise people will take advantage of you in that matter. You know, so so those are, uh, and of course, as a leader, you have to be up to date on what's going on around. You have to have a self-learning, self-development, 
always welcoming new information and understanding. And because of your listening skill, then you you listen and you think before you open your mouth. Right. Okay. So that's very important. You know that 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 rings so true. So I remember. I mean, people are bred differently, you know, based on where they came from. But I think ultimately, it all converges between those who manage tasks very well and those who manage relationships very well. And some people have a bias. Maybe that's the the female and male bias. Uh, if you're more masculine, you tend to be a good task manager. If you're a, a more feminine, uh, irrespective of your actual gender, but if you're more feminine, you're more relationship management. And speaking as someone who came from a, from a technical background, quote-unquote, finance, technology, it's very task-oriented. No? Run this program, produce this report. And the big shift for me when I became a leader was how many people will get hurt if you release that information? Or does this paint someone in a bad light? So in a way, it's kind of very political. Even politics itself is kind of a blend of both uh, masculine and feminine. However, if you're more from the kind of the relationship management side, the challenge will be, okay, how do you get back on the agenda? How do you move timetables? Because you're too busy, you know, stroking egos. Grab it. It's very hard, uh, honestly. I mean, I even, I struggle with it today. But you, you, parang ano lang eh sa Tagalog. You may discarte ka na eventually, you know, you know how to to say the right sound bite, press the right button. And eventually, I think everyone naman will be, uh, will will agree. Everyone's doing it for not just the benefit of their careers, but for the benefit of whatever, the organization or the country. So I don't think there's anyone out there who's actually looking to destroy anything. But maybe it's just always a, a conflict of styles, maybe, or a conflict of communication. And that's a lot now. Okay, um, just being conscious Sorry, that... can I just chime yeah, in go... on something that you said there? Is that you see the politics yes. place also. Okay, go there's ahead. good and bad politics. And there's certain organization, which is matrix organization, and it's a standard organization. So as a good leader, you have to use politics for good as as much as possible. But sometimes you have to play politics for the good of your people, uh, for that matter. And there is such a thing as principle of economic hazard. The economic hazard, it is the person saying, what's in it for me? And then the company is saying, what's in it for them? So you have to narrow, you have to minimize the gap between the needs of the person, what's in it for me, and the needs of the company. That's the principle of economic hazard. How do you minimize that? and instigate uh, or institutionalize policies and incentives to minimize that and so that the employees will see the goal of the company that is a mutual benefit for both their career themselves and the company. Yeah, and then it, it, it ultimately redounds to values. If you have a common shared sense of values. That's true. You, you can have a completely polar... Op yeah, That's what I like about dealing... I'm sorry to mention it, but that's what I love dealing with Offshore companies, no, or foreign companies. I mean, you can be at each at, at at each other's throats in the boardroom, but then after work, okay, let's grab a drink. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, and maybe this is me me talking about my experience in very local companies, Filipino companies. Alam mo yung expression na tatanim ng kamote. <laughs> you know, some of these grudges who go beyond the office and. And yeah, 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 you are correct about good and bad politics. You know, I have to say, when when I when I first entered my BPO job, which is still a banking job, but in a BPO, I was pleasantly surprised at the lack of politics. There still is, but it was all about politics of achievement. Okay, what have you done? Well done. Do you need any help? That's a very different culture to, uh, you know, a fault finding kind of politics or a blaming type of politics and. Sometimes it goes below the belt now. I mean, oh, this this person is trying to paint me in a bad light, and and then you you deserve. Uh, I, I'll I'll give you this small anecdote. Sorry to hijack this part, but I remember on day one of my BPO job. Uh, I just want to call it that for 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 uh, for clarity. And I was so I felt like a fish out of water because my inbox was empty. <laughs> <laughs> There's not like 20 emails deserving a very, very lengthy reply. And and people's replies were short. Yes or no? What do you need? Ganyan, no? There's no personal whatever vendetta, which I actually experienced on email. No? That's why the, the term keyboard warrior, which became popular later na, on social media, 
there are keyboard warriors in offices. And I was just so, okay, a lot of the automatic instincts I have when an email comes in suddenly didn't matter in this new job. Suddenly, okay, it's just about productivity or it's just about the result. There's no personal attack. There's no innuendo. There's no copying the world in some stupid you know, manifesto, mm. uh, which I experienced, unfortunately, you know, in, in another job. So anyway, I I want to come back to you. Um, what what are you looking forward to now? I mean, obviously it's been it was a it's a massive journey. It's a well, uh, I don't know how much of it was intentional. Sometimes you the job chooses you nga sabi nga nila, no? but you are you are now a, a product of the path that lies behind you, and now you have this canvas of where the possibilities and AI is one of those possibilities. What are the things that excite you about? this era given what you've done yeah uh, well at the end of the day you know having worked with a multinational company uh seeing the world and things like that and and then the offshoring as well i think at a certain stage in your life or even at the earlier stage you choose to do things that is meaningful that is purposeful that would really bring something good for the others. That is the reason why I said yes when I joined the Contact Island, the Contact Center Association of the Philippines, because I saw the target of $59 billion revenue for the economic growth of the country and giving jobs for everybody in the Philippines, which is poverty alleviation. Anything that has something to do with economic growth of a country and anything that will give job to others attracts me big time. So that is, as you would say, your ikigai, you know, the Japanese ikigai, which is, I what is ikigai. your, yeah, I, I I never realized what ikigai means. And I've realized and reflected, oh my God, what I'm doing is really finding my core and what I'm passionate with. So if I look at it, I know all of the companies working now in the Philippines as a BPO is already advancing in their technology for their AI and so forth and so on. I think there are a lot of needs in our country to be done. As I was mentioning to you, is that what, what is the size of companies that is bringing a lot of economic growth and churning the economy? How much is the small and medium enterprises there? And how much are the big companies? The big companies can take care of themselves. How can we take care of the small and medium enterprises, BPO or whatever industry they are, to prepare them to become AI enabled and capitalize on what is good that AI can bring? Do they have the resources to be able to do that? I think that's another thing we have to look at. I, uh, what is the country doing for them? Is our country regulation really enabling them? Are there a lot of service providers to help them? Do they have enough of the resources? You see, as a comparison, I've heard in Australia, 98% of their economy is driven by small and medium enterprises. 98%? By just, wow. Yes, 98%. And that's a lot. So on, on that basis, you have to enable that 98% to be ready for the future. So what is attracting me now is that how can we help the small, medium enterprises to be ready for the future? So that mm -hmm. one attracts me. Second, there's so many multinational companies already operating in the Philippines in offshoring or BPO, or not even the BPO. Um, what can I do now being in the US, being a biggest market for offshoring, the North America, what can I do to help the PTIC here, the Philippine Trade and Investment Center? Because right. having understood what the government is doing on the ground in the Philippines and the challenges of these companies operating in the Philippines for offshoring, you have a, an understanding of the challenge and there's still faith in the country. There is a lot of potential. So how can I... How can I then attract the investors here in this country? I know there's so many trade mission coming in the country, but sometimes a trade mission becomes like a touristing. Uh, it's nothing bad. It brings money to our country. But how do you turn that into real ROI as an investor? Yeah. So two things I'm looking at is what can we do with the small medium enterprises to enable them if we talk about AI? Okay. Second, the country is focused on countryside. There's so many talents in the countryside. How do you enable them to be ready as ready workforce for the AI of the future? As these companies grow more to the countryside, how can they be ready? So those initiatives are very key, the SMEs and the talents in the countryside. And you just don't deal on the organic growth in the country. 
how can we bring in the investors from here? Being here in the U.S., how can I how can I help PTIC? So those are the things that are are really occupying my mind right now. Having been with CCAP, is that you see more words, the more strategic movement can be done because every association is doing everything that they could yeah. to increase engagement of this BPO in the country, helping the academe uh, raise the bar of their graduates. But there's a bigger thing to be done in that area. Or maybe I go back to the Philippines and then run one of the BPOs. And on that basis, uh, uh, feel again the grip of what's on the ground. Yeah. And be able to be entrepreneurial. Yeah, get the pulse again. Because it's different. I've run one. I've, way, I've set up from ground up and really running it. And then running a nonprofit, seeing a bigger picture. It made me curious. Either I help in the bigger picture strategic as I described, or I go back into into really running it back and then the having multiple clients and getting more clients for that matter. You know? So th those are occupying my mind. Obviously, I don't forget my my experience in the testing inspection certification company. Because mm. you know, uh tick industry is testing inspection and certification. There is standards, and I realized there is now an ISO standard for AI. Yeah. And the very first is it, one is... Is it already out, out or is it still on a It's draft? already out in 2023. Okay. Uh, 14,001. There mm -hmm. are about 25 already developed. And if I could give you statistics, there are 25 already developed, 31 being underdeveloped now. Mm -hmm. 64 countries are involved in developing the standards for AI. And five working group, 150 experts worldwide uh, and liaison with all major international initiations of the standards. But there's already uh, 25. And the very first was the 14,001, which was in 2023, AI management system that provides guidelines for governance and management of AI technologies. So there is already, so there is some attempt already to put in order this chaotic AI as people perceive to be. There's a lot of people getting involved in it. And it's not just one, but international 64 countries involved yeah. in, in trying to form you know so no i'm and if you look at it overwhelmed AI, and if you look at there's it a lot that, of things mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot there's ai change and there's climate change how do you deal with the two climate mm -hmm. change and ai change you know those are two major change happening in the world yeah that's right Okay, I'm just conscious. Uh, I know there's so many other things we can talk about, but we have to save some for the next episode, as I always say. Um, <laughs> parting thoughts for now. No, anything that you want people to to hang on to, and yeah, and it's something we can pick up in our next in our next chat. Yeah, well, the the parting words I could probably say is that use AI for good. Okay, I know there's a lot of uh, feeling of insecurity of what it means. To the person what it means to my colleague and what it means for my business but at the end of the day ai for good has a lot of potentials at the very least two potentials on that one is that the potential to enhance productivity and efficiency that's very important and business should be really considering the ai ethics on doing the efficiency and productivity increase by using ai but there's another aspect that has to be understood is trust Mm -hmm. You know, the trust that the, there's a risk of losing trust with your customers if 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 they haven't really grasped the potentials of it. So those things, it's a very difficult to to balance. But that's where AI ethics will come out is really balancing these two. But at the end of the day, it is really a lot of economic economic growth, a potential for changes of new business processes in the supply chain. And a lot of opportunity for people to have their creativity cultivated into this new business model. Okay. So I'd like to thank you, Rosario, for joining us and hope to have you again in another chat. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity and see you soon, Doc.